Hi, I'm Scott Blakely with Blakely Bassoon Studios and Lil Ass Kickers Bassoon Reads. If you're like me, you've had something on your mind lately. Weber's Bassoon Concerto, specifically the first movement, measures 140 through 170. This just so happens to be the excerpt that's on the California High School Allstate Band audition, but I have a hunch even those of you who are not auditioning for California Allstate Band will end up working on this concerto. There was a white guy, then he died, and we still play his music, CMW. Of course, if you don't play bassoon, you might be thinking, this video is not for me. But it is for you. Are you alive? Well, music is life. So strap in and let's get going. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, okay. And then the bassoon comes in. I'm typically not a fan of starting my practice at the beginning of a piece. However, it's really important, especially when we're looking at a development section, to really understand the context of what we're playing. So obviously at measure 140, our A theme has returned again, but we've modulated down a minor third. And the, one of the first things right off the bat that a, a musician needs to consider is, how do I want to make this similar to how I played it before and how do I want, want to make it different? And it's really important to think about these things because if, if you don't think about it, you're really surrendering a lot of your artistic freedom. It doesn't mean that you can't be spontaneous, but if you're not aware of, of the context of the music you're playing, then it would kind of be like if you were in a play in a language that you don't speak and reading all these words that you don't know what they mean. So with that said, what is the character in the beginning? I think something that's often more important than the, than the notes, the pitches and the rhythms that the composer gives us are the other instructions. What I'm talking about is risoluto. Risoluto appears in both the very beginning and right here, which means resolute. You're sure of what you're saying. You're, it's, everything is very intentional about what we're doing here. Guys, this is nuts. I'm a few hours into editing this video for you, and I was gonna put up an image of Weber's manuscript where it says Risoluto, except it doesn't say Risoluto in Weber's manuscript. I mean, it's not in my William Waterhouse edition either. I've just been taking Leonard Shero's word for it all this time, and 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 I I. I that's often a pretty good starting point for playing any, any bit of music, but it's especially important in this concerto to have that resolute sound. This is what happens so often. A teacher will become confident they know something and they'll just run with it and everyone's gonna learn, everyone learns from what they said and they run with it and they run with it and then we have, we have, we have all this misinformation. Now, now, Risoluto still makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense to think of the the main theme this way in the concerto. Uh, but it's not as fundamental as I have thought. For years, I thought it was fundamental. If I, if I don't sound resolute. It's just, I mean, it's really boring. Now, the thing about a lot of these, uh, when you're given words like risoluto, con fuoco, is when do these descriptions expire? I think that that is beautifully vague. In other words, I think that's an opportunity for, for the musician to sort of decide. How long are you gonna be resolute in your playing? Um, you might decide all the way through, and to some degree, I think we always should be resolute. But you know, this, this particular character of, of everything I'm saying is on purpose. This is exactly how I wanna say it. In order to feel intentional, we generally have to have a concept in our minds of what do I want this to sound like? All too often, I think people kind of skip that and they sort of let the notes on the page and their instruments kind of figure that out for them. The attitude of I meant to do that I think is really important even if you're making up the notes, right?
<laughs> that sounded awful, right? But that's very different than if I was like... Now I played the correct notes, but I don't think I sounded very intentional. And honestly, I think you could really argue that the first version fit the character, you know, felt more like the concerto than the second version, right? Even if you don't have complete control of your instrument, and that's honestly true for most of us, having that attitude is can be remarkably helpful with some of the technical and rhythmic challenges of a piece of music. So in the name of resoluteness, we need to talk about the grace notes. Grace notes can be very controversial and you can go down some pretty deep rabbit holes trying to research how a particular style of grace note was played in a particular time and place and people will argue about it and composers throughout time have definitely kind of had different ideas in their mind what those grace notes mean. But I want to talk about the grace note here because it's really important to have a sense of what we're going to do with it. This type of grace note has another name, which is called an acciaccatura. Acciaccatura comes from acacciare, which literally means to crush or bruise or squash. It has a very different connotation than grace note, right? Grace, crush, bruise, squash. Grace, crush, bruise, squash. Grace, maybe we can crush and bruise and squash gracefully. In fact, on a, on a keyboard instrument, the way that this uh, ornament can, has often been played is, is where both notes are actually played at the same time, but the achacatura is released immediately. So the notes really are literally crushed together. If you're going to crush or squash the achacatura, I think it's a pretty good argument for playing on the beat. Another argument, I think, is because in this particular case, we have so many um, dotted eighth sixteenth rhythms that if we play the grace note ahead of the beat, it's just going to sound like it's another one of the iterations of the dotted eighth sixteenth, right? That was just as if, I mean, that was almost a triplet, right? If you were trying to write that down, I don't think you would notice that that was a grace note right? Even if we tried to put it off and do it just ahead of the beat as if it was a 32nd note, it still sounds like a 16th note. Now that we have resolved to crush our achacaturas, we can play with resolve. Or if you resolve to play them another way, that's fine, but do it with resoluteness. I want to give another piece of advice about grace notes and trills. And that is that the note is still the note. What the hell does that mean? It means that I don't think of it as multiple pitches. I think of it as one pitch. It just happens to be kind of fancy. This really helps me sort of remain my rhythmic integrity if I'm sort of thinking of it that way. And I think in this case, it can help me, again, just have that sort of resolute feeling. And if I'm ever having trouble with an ornament, making an ornament sound like, oh, I really meant to do that, then I'll practice playing without the ornament for a while. Because really the, 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 the passage here is, we're just gonna make it a little fancier, fancy. Okay, we've made it through the first measure. Even though I may have, just, have been known to have described the opening of this concerto as boring, there's something I think kind of interesting about the second measure. Uh, and I'm, I'm talking specifically about the second half of the third beat. Now in the opening, that note is an eighth note. And three, a four. Here in the development, it's written as a 16th note. And I think that's pretty curious because playing it as an eighth note, this sort of stretched out and three, a four is not what the ear is really expecting to hear. 
But Weber only puts that at the very beginning of the concerto, or, or the very beginning of the, the bassoon entrance. It's nowhere in the strings. It's nowhere else do we actually get that this sort of rhythm. Arguably, you could say that kind of happens in measure 68. We have that eighth, we, we divide the beat by an eighth note, but there's no dot at a 16th that, you know, we're, there, it just kind of has that feel. So I, I looked at the original manuscript in 1811 and then uh, Weber revised it again in 1822. In both cases, that um, third beat of the opening is an eighth note. And it's in both cases in the measure 141, there's a 16th note. I really, really question whether Weber, this was just a, a complete oversight or if he really meant to put this very subtle difference in, not only is it nowhere else, there's nowhere in the strings, but you know, really um, you have to imagine that this was done at a time before we had recordings. Most people, when you heard this, you, you weren't gonna hear it again or at least not for a long, uh, quite a while. So the expectation to hear that as a 16th note hasn't really been established that strongly at this point. But to me, if you were gonna make that subtle difference, it makes sense to have the subtle difference happen after you've done it the normal way, right? Again, for those of you that are auditioning for Allstate, if you're ever in a situation where you're being asked to use a specific edition, it's probably safer to stick with what is written exactly. But to you as an artist, if you're playing this for yourself, if you're playing it um, you know, in, in an edition it hasn't been specified, or if it's, you're playing it for others, Again, I think that you've got the freedom here to think about it. It might make sense to, to um, make that note an eighth note here. Right? Uh, or not. And it certainly is the reason not to be all snooty at someone for, you know, making the decision otherwise. Now let's move on to measure 147, the con fuoco. And if you're looking at the Leonard Shero edition or a lot of other editions, it also says animato, but I want to specify. Weber not, did not write animato, but he did write con fuoco. What does fuoco mean? Bing! Fuoco. Fire. So, when you get to measure 147, we play with fire. What does that mean? Again, that is for you to decide. If you want to have pyrotechnics, fine. If you just want to use your lighter, fine. If you want to be more metaphoric in the way that you play, that's probably for the best. Playing animato, more animated, might make sense there, right? So now that we're playing with fire, are we also resolute? I would argue yes. But again, that is an artistic decision. It doesn't have to be risoluto. But regardless of what you decide, one of the things that I hear my students uh, do very often is place unintentional accents within the music. There are accents written here, and the accents are Weber's accents. Accent on one, accent on three, and then no accents. It's very easy to get carried away and start accenting when there's nothing written. If you do it resolutely, Fine. As opposed to Yeah, that kind of messes with my tongue to do that. You know, sometimes we have a tendency to, to accent on particular beats. I catch myself playing unintentional accents fairly frequently. Um, and it's something that I'm always sort of looking out for. Sometimes when I notice it, I, I think to myself, you know what, that sounds good. Let me make sure that I play it in a way that sounds like I did it on purpose. Other times I'm like, wait a second, no, 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 no. Let's, let's, let's get rid of that accent. I mentioned that a lot of editions have the onomato. It's pretty common to speed up here a little bit. It's pretty common to slow down just before. <laughs> I, again, I think these are all artistic decisions. I wouldn't get slower when you catch fire. Moving on, uh, we start seeing a bunch of slurs. Now, interestingly enough, those slurs are not in any of Weber's manuscripts. C-M-W in Weber was his name, oh. The slurs were added in by an editor a little bit later, and they kind of appear in 
almost every other edition of this concerto. There's a ton of other slurs that are not in the manuscript as well, by the way. You fool! And most recordings, you'll hear people playing slurs, and you'll hear them doing the same slur pattern of, of three notes slurred together. But it's not Weber's. I do think the slurs sound good, and I also kind of wonder, what if we changed the slur pattern? Why do we have to do three and three and three? Why not do three and two, or two and two? Or you could kind of mix it up. There's so many different things that you could do here to make it more interesting for you, the player. Yes, they require practice. The other thing I think that about this section is that it's tricky to get all the notes out here. I say this as someone who hasn't worked on this concerto in a couple decades. I don't think it's actually tricky because it's awkward in the hands. I think it's tricky because it's awkward on the eyes. What I mean by that is even though we might know this really well, our eyes get so glued to the page. And we've got so much going on visually here, like, oh, all of a sudden there's C sharps, now there's uh, A sharps, uh, now there's an E flat, like, you know, switching between sharps and flats. There's so many things the brain is processing when our eyes are open, just by being open. And if we're trying to read music, our brain has to do so much to follow those notes. So it really, really gets in the way. So what I really recommend you do is you really should memorize a section like this. You know, practice with your eyes closed. And when you catch yourself missing a note, you know, if your ear is what tells you, wait, that's not the right note, that kind of mistake I find is much easier to learn from than sort of visually getting all confused. When we stop reading the music, we free up so much of our brains to pay attention to what things sound like. A way that you can do this is to memorize it one measure at a time, right? So I'm Another advantage to our brains not having to visually track each and every note we're playing is it gives our brain a lot more ability to hear and feel tempo. And I think one of the reasons why we're often not aware of rushing or dragging is that our brain is too busy doing other things. A lot of people will approach the reading of music like sort of checking themselves. Was that the right note? Was this the right note? Is the, what's the next note? What's the next note? And, and we kind of do the same thing like, oh, was that, was I right on time? Was I, am I rushing? Am I dragging? Does it go there? Does it go there? Does it go there? But what we can do when we're sort of playing by ears, we can just listen. We're like, does it feel right? Does it sound right? The less distracted we are, the better judgment we'll have of that. Okay. So it's not in the audition this year, at least, to play all the way to measure 174. But I do want to talk about this next little section um, just a tiny bit because uh, at, in this edition and in a lot of editions, it's marked dolce at measure 171. Weber, once again, puts the dolce at 170, which to me makes a lot more sense. And two and three and four and one, two, the whole thing is dolce. As opposed to, uh, you know, con fuoco. And two and three and four and dolce. Dee 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 dee. You know, like that could be a little bit more of a maniacal interpretation. And I think that would be fine. But it's, it's difficult and it must be done on purpose. Are dolce and risoluto in conflict with each other? Right now I'm speaking to you in a resolute voice. But now I'm going to speak to you in a much sweeter voice. The sweeter voice is... It feels a little bit less resolute. To me, if I speak sweetly and resolute at the same time, it's actually patronizing, motherfucker. <laughs> to me, sweet sweetness, sweetness and resolute are very different things. A real question when you see this in editions is, where's the dolce really going to start and how long does it last? In this case, it's pretty simple because we see resoluto come uh, again as we enter the recapitulation a few bars later. It's really important that we mentally shift from feeling resolute to feeling sweet. And in fact, we've just been playing with fire and now we've got to be sweet. There was fire, now there's candy, right? I just want to try to, to play what's written in the edition here. I'm going to keep the fire for the eighth notes leading in to bar 170 whatever. <laughs> It's, it, it works, you can do it, but it's, it's, it's hard. It takes a lot of focus. 
So let's wrap up this, our, our look at this first movement for today. To me, the main takeaway in all of this is just a reminder of how very important the words are. <laughs> the words or stage directions, whatever you want to call them. Dolce, risoluto. By the way, when they're not there, that's just more chance for us to decide what they should be. By the way, the words don't have to be Italian. Weber was German. I don't know why, I mean, why he picked so many Italian words. There's so many beautiful German words he could have used instead. But in this particular section of this movement, we really just have resolute, fire, and dolce. So here's one final example. Thank you for watching this video. Please like and subscribe. There was fire. Now there's candy. I've just been taking Leonard Shero's word for it all this time. And, and, and I, I, I've 